Thanks, everyone, for coming out to this iteration of the Cyber Intelligence Markets Weekly Technical Exchange. This week, we have Jennifer Bergstrom from our Legacy Polaris Off acquisition, and she's going to be giving a discussion on chaos engineering. Chaos engineering, as it turns out, is not the same sort of engineering we all did as undergraduates, and it's a more deliberate way of ensuring our software functions well under failure conditions. Uh, with that, Jennifer, I'll leave the floor to you. Thanks, Justin. All right, so I am going to talk about chaos engineering today, which is the uh, practice of injecting failure to prevent failure. So go ahead and whoops, get started. So on the agenda, who am I? Um, and then we'll talk a little bit about the history of chaos engineering, its benefits, how to implement it, what some tools and best practices are, and some of the capabilities that we have within Parsons. Um, as always, if you have any questions as I'm going through the slide deck, please feel free to chime in and ask them. I will answer them when it's appropriate to do so. Um, so first up, who am I? Uh, I'm a former software engineer who's seen the power of chaos engineering. So I've spent about 10 years doing software engineering for Lockheed Martin. That was in a variety of different languages, C, C++, Java, uh, Python, and of course, a variety of scripting languages as well. And then after Lockheed, I came to Heritage Solidine and came to Parsons that way. And I was hired into Solidine as a Java application engineer. Uh, so I was doing large scale, you know, enterprise scale applications. And currently I'm the site director and software engineer here at Space Architecture in Denver DTC, or the Denver DTC office. I do have a collection of certifications to my name um, that have been very, very useful, including nine AWS certs and then an Azure cert and Security Plus. When I came to Solidine in 2015, I thought that clouds were only in the skies. I'd never done anything with cloud engineering. I didn't, or with cloud architecture, I didn't know what public clouds were. Um, you know, they were, they were white poofy things in the sky. I didn't know microservice design or widely distributed systems. I had always been an enterprise or an enterprise engineer and just a software developer at that. So, you know, the concept of microservices and, and systems that use them was not something I was familiar with. And I didn't worry about system failures. I was a software engineer. I didn't care. I wrote code. But now that I'm at Parsons in 2020, I do design systems and software solutions that are in AWS and Azure clouds. I include security as an integral part of the systems I create. Every software that we, you know, every piece of software that we write has to consider security. And I inject failure deliberately into the systems that we're creating to improve the quality of the systems that we deliver. So a history of chaos engineering, let's talk about a little bit about the origins of it. So first off, some definitions. Chaos engineering really is a different approach to software quality assurance and testing from what many people are familiar with. Netflix was the pioneer of chaos engineering and their definition is that chaos engineering is the discipline of experimenting on a software system in production. And it's important that in production piece in order to build confidence in the system's capability to withstand turbulent and unexpected conditions. There's a very active chaos engineering community out there right now, and they broadened the definition a little bit. So it is still experimentation on a system to uncover weaknesses, but it's no longer just in production. Uh, you can do chaos engineering in production, and that's where the majority of it is done. But you can also bring in aspects of chaos engineering into your test environment, into your development environment, um, so that you're testing with chaos throughout far more of your system. So one of the things that I get asked a lot when I'm talking about chaos engineering is, is it chaos theory? Is it based on chaos theory? And the answer is no, not really. Uh, chaos engineering is its own concept. They do have some similarities. The biggest one being that both of them emphasize that things are not random, right? With chaos engineering, you're not doing random testing. And with chaos theory, large complex systems that look random really aren't. That's about the only real uh, similarity that they have. So bottom line is chaos engineering is deliberately injecting failure into your system to prevent failure in your system. So a little more history. When we're looking at historical failure testing, 
there were some standard types of testing that were often done, right? Thought experiments were one. Um, you get a bunch of engineers in a table, you know, sitting around a table in a room talking about all the different failure points that they know about in your system and how they think the system will respond if any of those failure points actually do fail. It was heavy on hypotheticals, light on actual text, test execution. And when we did do actual testing, it was often very contrived. The idea of even testing in fraud was not even considered. It was way too scary. It was way too risky. And you, you just couldn't do it. It wasn't an option. But the problem you run into is that your test environments typically don't look like what your production environment looks like, especially if you're dealing with large on-premises uh, systems. It costs too much to have a test string that is the same size as production, or it's just not possible. And another problem is that oftentimes when you're testing, you would tailor make your test environment and your test system to handle specific failures. So the idea that, hey, we can test a failure if we kick the system a very specific way, it's gonna handle that failure. But what happens if somebody kicks with their other foot? It may not handle that, it may break. Um, the other thing that traditional failure or historical failure testing tended to miss was the unintended ripple effects of real failure. In the real environment, oftentimes it's not the initial failure that really takes the system down. It's all of the cascading ripples and the way that they intersect and bump into each other that causes problems. As an example, uh, in one of the systems that I've supported in the past, we had an NFS failure. And that NFS failure shouldn't have taken down the system. The NFS drive was a redundant drive, and it should have been able to just continue chugging on and go to the failback drive, right, the backup drive. But that led to logging failure, which backed up the database, which backed up the applications, and ultimately the whole system crashed, all because of a failure that they thought they had planned for and prepared for. Unintended ripple effects are a big problem. So the bottom line is typical failure testing often doesn't actually mitigate failure. And this is a growing problem. Historical failure testing wasn't sufficient to catch the problems because of the reasons we've already discussed, oversimplified environments, oversimplified scenarios, and insufficient scope. You didn't really catch the ripple effects and test for those as well. And in addition to that, our systems are growing more and more complex. Now this diagram shows the Netflix architecture and their simplified architecture, which is you know, simplified to try to aid people's understanding is still pretty complex, but then you look at the actual architecture, and this is a global system. It's geographically distributed. It's made of hundreds to thousands of microservices. You really can't simulate that in the test environment. It's too big in scale. It's too big in scope. There's too many failure points. Then when you add to that the increased user base that our software as a service products tend to, to carry, and you can't simulate the user load on your system either in a test environment. Netflix had 61 million US users in 2019, and I would imagine that number's only gone up with all of the COVID changes that have happened. You can't simulate the load on a system of 61 million users in a test environment. So chaos engineering grew from a need to test large scale, widely distributed systems that have millions of users and in public cloud. Failure always happens, and cloud does not inherently solve the problem. All of the major cloud providers, public cloud providers out there, advertise at least four nines of reliability, which sounds great. The problem is unexpected outages in the cloud do still occur. The average may be four nines of reliability, but what about that one time it does fail? Can your system survive it? So just like in an on-premises data center, you still have to plan for outages and you have to prepare for those and your system needs to be able to withstand them. And there have been historical failures on major platforms. AWS has had several, Azure has had a few that were very big and these failures sometimes knock out entire regions or multiple sets of data centers. Um, that's something that a system that's deployed into the cloud has to be prepared to handle. And in addition to that, cyber attacks and distributed denial of service type attacks are on the rise and they're getting larger in scope. You know, before public cloud became as popular as it is today, you would oftentimes see a distributed denial of service attack on the range of, you know, 500 megabits per second. 
This year, we had one that was 2.3 terabits per second. Magnitudes larger. Can your system handle that? How do you test to make sure that it does? Failure is a reality that has to be addressed. You can't avoid it. You can't dodge it. It's going to happen. So the concept of chaos engineering comes into play. Netflix, Netflix pioneered the concept of chaos engineering with their Chaos Monkey, which they introduced in 2010. And Chaos Monkey is a test tool, an automated test tool that randomly chooses servers and disable them in their system. This was created because Netflix had recent, had moved into on-premise or from their on-premise data centers into the public cloud, AWS, and they realized that the servers in AWS were more transient than on-prem. So they had to make sure that their design could survive that. Netflix cares about their customers, or at least they depend upon their customers to keep them alive, and they didn't want their customer experience to degrade when servers failed. But Netflix quickly realized that Chaos Monkey by itself was not sufficient. There are a lot of other failures that can happen in your systems. What if you lose several servers? What if an entire data center fails? What if multiple data centers fail? You know, there are a lot of other failure modes that Chaos Monkey didn't test. So testing that single server loss was a good start, but it wasn't enough. And Netflix's scale was so large that the only way they really could test for failure was on their production system. Uh, Chaos Engineering continues to expand from what Netflix start, started with with the Chaos Monkey. They actually open sourced Chaos Monkey in 2012, and they did that because they realized it was a very valuable resource to have, and they wanted the broader community to be able to test chaos uh, failures on their systems as well. They didn't open source the rest of the Simeon Army, but they did make Chaos Monkey available. Netflix also created the Chaos Engineering role in 2014, and they did this because they realized that this failure injection testing that they were doing was absolutely essential to the success of their system, and it needed to be done by a dedicated group of engineers. It couldn't be just the developers or the test engineers doing this as a part-time thing. It needed to be a full-time recognized responsibility. Failure injection testing in the production system during regular business hours is critical for Netflix's reliability. And the Simeon Army does continue to expand with more actors over time. As they've found new failures in their system, they've added new Simeons to recreate them. Uh, some examples, I've listed out a few examples here. Uh, for one, the Chaos Kong, which simulates the failure of multiple data centers or a regional failure in AWS. Security Monkey lets them search for and terminate resources that have improper security settings. So that Im improves their security standpoint and keeps their system safer. Compliance Monkey does the same thing, but with environmental standards. So if, if resources are deployed that aren't properly labeled or that have wrong software packages that they didn't approve for use or various things like that, they automatically using their chaos tools go in and find those and delete them. So Netflix is continuing to expand their failure testing, and they do that as they find failures in their system. And they do that to ensure that outages aren't repeated. They may get burned once by a failure, but they're not going to get burned multiple times by that same failure. So who is using chaos? This is an eye chart, I admit that. Uh, it's, I know it's very difficult to read, but the main thing I want to emphasize with this chart is that chaos engineering is not just used by Netflix. It's not just used by one or two unicorn companies that have decided it's important. It's used in multiple industries by multiple different large companies. You can see if you look on here at the lower left, there's Fidelity. In the center left, Google uses this. Uh, Pivotal Cloud Foundry uses it. Kubernetes uses it. Uh, Netflix, of course, does. Um, there are a variety of different companies out there. Amazon Web Services uses it to test their resources as well. So they're running chaos engineering on the platform that they provide for you. And that's one of the ways that they can guarantee the availabilities that they provide for their systems. So there, we've talked some about the history of chaos engineering. Whoops. And let's go ahead and look at the benefits of chaos engineering a little more. So chaos engineering is a learning tool. It's a tool that lets you understand your system more fully. Learning from unexpected outages, we all do that. We've done that in systems in the past, but it's painful and it can be very costly. There was a survey I was reading that was taken recently um, for a lot of large commercial companies. And the result of the survey was that 
a single hour of downtime, a single hour of outage for commercial companies, over 80% of the companies report that that costs them at least $500,000. For roughly 30% of the commercial companies that participated in the survey, a single outage of that nature of one hour costs them over a million dollars. It's expensive to have unplanned failures that take your system down. Chaos engineering is like online education. It lets you learn on your own schedule. It lets you test things when you're prepared for those failures to happen and when you have your team there to support them so that you can make sure that then when they happen and you're not expecting them, your system will recover from them. It lets you move from your post-mortem failure analysis, which is so common, to the pre-mortem failure experiments. You're testing your failures deliberately. It's kind of like doing a fire drill in an office, except for that you're lighting an actual fire and then making sure your system puts it out appropriately. Chaos engineering tests are usually, I say often in the slide, but it really should be usually derived from previous failures. An ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure. You felt the pain of a failure once, you wanna make sure you're not gonna feel it again in your system. So you go and design a chaos engineering failure test to validate that your system and the changes you made to it are preventing that failure from occurring again. And in our industry, cost often isn't just measured in dollars, it's measured in human lives. When your systems fail, you're putting people at risk. And that's a real you know, scary thing. You don't want to be putting people at risk for a failure that you weren't prepared for. Now that oftentimes also means that our customers are not willing to let us do chaos engineering in the production environment. And that's one of the reasons why I've talked throughout this presentation about how you can use chaos engineering within your test environment. You can build it into your DevOps pipelines and run it automatically in an environment where a failure isn't going to damage people. But by doing it, even in that test environment, you're increasing the reliability of your operational system and you're helping protect those human lives through the use of chaos engineering. So chaos engineering is a hands-on educational tool. You're actually doing the failure experiments. You're seeing the real results of it. That lets you examine the ripple effects that we talked about. It lets you see what really happens in your system and make sure that it really can survive it. So we've talked about running chaos engineering in ops, and I know that that's not always possible, but the idea is you need to test like you fly and fly like you test. Test environments are oftentimes undersized compared to production. Differing configurations between test and prod can cause behavioral differences. A lot of systems that I've worked in have different environment variables that are set to tell it whether to tell the system whether it's running in test or prod. And when you have different configurations like that, you're really not testing the same system. You're not testing prod if you're testing in test. So it kind of invalidates your testing, which is why chaos engineering does encourage careful, well-planned testing in the prod environment. That's the ultimate goal. That's what you really want to do. And the reason is because if you're testing a Tesla, you can't exactly test a, Sur a Surrey and expect the results to be valid, right? This testing the Surrey is not the same as testing a Tesla. They don't respond the same. They don't behave the same. There are a whole different scale of functionality and uh, needs that you have in failure modes that can happen. So testing in the test environment isn't enough to mitigate the failures in the production environment. Chaos engineering can also provide guardrails to your DevOps process. If you use chaos engineering on your system, then you're going to be pretty confident that you have a strong and resilient system. If you know that you have a strong and resilient system, then you can start automatically terminating components that aren't compliant. Because you know your system will recover from that automatically. And if you can enforce those rules compliance in your production system automatically, then your developers can't push non-compliant or low quality modifications into prod. Chaos engineering can be used to enforce compliance in prod. And here's some examples of things that you can test for and that you can automatically do to get rid of non-compliance. When you can test for these types of things automatically, that enables people to trust your DevSecOps pipelines more fully because they know that if something were to slip through the pipeline in production and, and make it to production, it would be caught in production using the chaos engineering tools that you have. So it enables strict compliance enforcement without gatekeepers. This lets you remove a lot of those human, you know, stop points that are put into place oftentimes in systems because you're automatically testing for them, you're automatically enforcing them. 
and that can speed up the rate of your whole development process without reducing the quality of it and without reducing your confidence in the security of the system. So some examples of guardrails that you can use. You can isolate servers that have unhealthy CPU or a memory load. There's a lot of reasons that you might have servers that have that. If their software has gone wrong, if they have memory leaks, if somebody has hacked into that server and is overloading it, you know, there's a lot of different things that could cause that. But you can isolate those. You can remove them from operations or at least not let them talk to other servers within your system. You can clean up unused resources that are cluttering the environment. Uh, remove those unhealthy ones, remove unused resources. If somebody started something up as a test and then forgot to remove it, you can have the system do that automatically for you using chaos engineering. In cloud in particular, you pay for the resources that you're using. So let's save some money for the company. Let's remove those resources that are unhealthy or that aren't being used. You can remove deployed resources that are non-compliant with your environment settings. If you have multiple different programs that are operating within the same environment, they all need to be tagged. You can check for that tagging and you can delete ones that aren't tagged properly. So it keeps your, your system clean, it keeps it understandable and it keeps the traceability good in your system. You can remove them that are deployed with non-compliant security settings. If somebody deploys something that is vulnerable in a way it shouldn't be, you can check for that and you can remove it. And that makes your system stronger and more resistant and removes vulnerabilities. So chaos engineering provides you a lot of new tools and they're automated tools that you can use to enforce compliance. Instead of having a person scrolling through and trying to find it or using a tool like Chef or Puppet, you can use your chaos engineering tools. So how do we implement chaos engineering? So in order to do chaos engineering effectively, you do have to have some significant system knowledge. You need to know what your mission critical components are. You need to know if they are designed and built for fault tolerance. There are design decisions that may be made that don't result in a system being designed for fault tolerance and that's okay. But before you start injecting chaos engineering into that system, you need to understand that and you need to know what parts should be able to fail. And without disabling your system and what components shouldn't. If it's a component that shouldn't be able to fail or that won't fail without disabling your system, then you should not be doing chaos engineering testing on that component. What monitoring do you have on your system? If you can't learn by checking your logs and your monitoring, when you inject failure into your system, chaos engineering is not gonna be very effective. So you need to be aware of what monitoring tools you have available and how you can use those. You also need to be aware of what failures you see in your production system. If you're testing for a whole bunch of failures, but they're not the ones that are actually happening, then there's limited value in what you're doing. And you should look at what requirements in your system could benefit from validation using chaos engineering. A lot of systems out there have availability requirements or you know various other things like that that could be validated using your chaos engineering. You could start knocking out different components in the system and demonstrate that it actually does stay up, that it's still available. So it's a nice tool to use when you're, when you're doing validation of requirements. So benefiting from chaos engineering does require a deep knowledge of the system. You don't wanna just start knocking things out and try to guess what is gonna be effective for testing. So how do we get started with this? Well, the first part is analyzing. Look for the components that are highest, most likely to fail in your operational system and which ones are designed to survive that failure. Then figure out how to emulate those failures. A lot of times public cloud companies get a little bit upset if you decide that you're gonna to try to take down a region or a data center, right? That's not really possible. You don't wanna to try to do that, but you can emulate the failure of a data center. You can emulate the failure of a region. You can do that using bash scripts or pythons or Python code, there's a lot of different techniques that you can use that are automatable. And then you start testing. You don't start testing in ops, right? That's the ultimate goal is to get to ops, but really you wanna test in your test environment or in a disposable environment first. And only if you pass the testing in that failure environment, then you would move to starting to use that same method and the same scripts that you've written to test in your operational environment. If you don't survive the test, you still have learned a lot from that and you can go back and make changes to your system to make sure that you can pass the tests in the test environment. 
And then you automate. If you haven't already done that, make sure that you add those testing or seek to add that testing that you're doing into your build and deploy pipelines. This is especially valuable as you begin to grow the chaos engineering that you're doing because you don't want to stop testing with the original chaos tests that you came up with. You want to add to them because that way you make sure that your system doesn't lose its resiliency or doesn't backslide in any areas just because you've added in new capabilities or made different modifications. So if you put the testing into your build and deploy pipelines and are running them regularly, automatically, you're gonna make sure you don't have that problem. And of course, you iterate. You wanna keep looking for failure tests to add. When you have real failures that happen in your system, you wanna find a way to test those and you're gonna add them to your suite of chaos engineering tests that you run on your system. Wash, rinse, repeat, keep doing that. So chaos engineering is an iterative process. Just like Netflix keeps adding to their Simeon army, your suite of chaos engineering tests are going to grow over time. Uh, so who should be involved in chaos, tests, in chaos engineering? Well, first off, it shouldn't be done in a stovepipe or a vacuum. You need to have people involved in it that have buy-in responsibility. Um, for your initial chaos testing, small scale, you can probably do that just as a developer on your own in a disposable environment, and that's fine. But as soon as you start expanding it into long-lived test environments or even short-lived test environments that other people are observing, and absolutely as soon as you start putting it, pushing it out into production or before you start pushing it out into production, you need to make sure that the folks that are going to be impacted by that understand what's happening and that it's being done on purpose and why it's being done. So I listed out a few of the folks that you need to have buy-in from uh, before you really start implementing chaos engineering, especially in the production environment. All right, so some tools and best practices for chaos engineering. Let's look over some tools. Chaos engineering doesn't have to be complex. Even though it's chaos, it's not necessarily complex. It can be simple. You can write your own tools. Uh, the chaos gorilla tool that we use in our CNSP stack was implemented using a few hundred lines of Python code. And, you know, we probably could have done it with less lines than that, but we were fighting AWS to make sure that we could really convince our system that they had lost a data center. And AWS doesn't like to let you think that you've lost a data center when you haven't. So we had to add extra code just to continue to convince the system that, yeah, that data center really was gone. Um, but a couple hundred lines of Python code, not real complex. There's also a whole suite of open source libraries available on GitHub. Uh, and these are scripts that have been written by other chaos engineers across the industry and then shared for people to use. GitHub Scientist is a framework that you can use that helps protect your end users and helps limit the blast radius of your testing so that you can test a little more freely without being as worried about taking your system down. Pumba is a chaos monkey for Docker containers. And there are several other Docker tools out there for chaos engineering that test losing nodes, losing you know larger clusters and various other things like that and then inject latency into in between containers and that type of thing. So there's some good tooling out there that are open sourced and available for people to use. And then Gremlin, if you want the, you yes. know, the, okay? the big suite of yeah. service, Gremlin actually provides chaos yeah. as a service. So they have a full set of instrumentation. They have, you know, graphics and things like that, that you can look at to, to oh, analyze your system. Yeah. And they provide support to help oh, you put that in place. So chaos engineering can be accomplished with simple tools. You don't have to spend money to buy licenses to use a lot of the resources that are available out there to do your chaos. So let's go over some best practices and then I'll come back to Timothy's question. So one of the main things with chaos engineering, and I've touched on this a few times already, is you do want to automate the testing as much as possible. You want these tests to be things that you can do over and over and over again as your system evolves over time to make sure that you're still keeping that strength and that resiliency and that uh, protection against the failures. You do want to include a kill switch that allows the test to be stopped immediately. Move my chat window here, if it's going haywire. Sometimes you're gonna do a test and those unexpected ripples are gonna start causing big problems. You don't wanna take down your system with those unexpected ripples. So you have to make sure that you plan for that. Don't test in production if you know your system will fail the test. We talked about this. If you know that a component of your system is not designed to be fault tolerant or resilient, don't try to test that one. You know it's gonna fail. 
the point of these tests isn't to test the ones that you know are going to fail necessarily. It's to test the ones that you think you've designed to not fail to make sure that they really don't. Do test during regular business hours, especially when testing in prod. You have more support present and you have a faster recovery response if the system fails in unexpected ways. You also then are training your people in how to properly respond when those failures happen, which is also a huge benefit because then people aren't caught off guard because they've seen that failure before. Do plan and document the testing that will be executed. Make sure that you make it clear what you're doing and what you expect to happen and how you're doing it. Start small. Don't try to eat the whole elephant in one bite. It's not going to work. Netflix started with Chaos Monkey. They didn't start with their whole simian army. They've expanded, but they didn't start there. Do test frequently. This is part of why automating is so important. You want to run these tests as often as you can. Make sure that every time you're pushing updates out, your system is still resilient and fault tolerant. And you do want to communicate those tests and their purposes clearly to the entire team. Documenting them is great, but if you dump your document out in SharePoint somewhere and nobody knows where it is and nobody ever looks at it, it's not real valuable. So you do need to communicate those and make sure that the team understands and knows what's going on. So chaos engineering should be well planned. And this is one of those similarities to chaos theory, which is why I put the Mandelbrot set in here. Your chaos testing, your chaos engineering should not be random. It should be well formulated. It should have an order and a pattern to it. And it should be reliably executed, meaning that you know what those failures are that are going to happen in your system and you know to expect them to happen. All right, let's come back to Timothy's question here real quick. All right, so reliability requirements are changing over time. So they need to get more and more reliable over time, it looks like. <laughs> So, Timothy, you say that maybe the answer is that chaos testing is a core fit for a system whose reliability requirements change significantly over time. I would actually assert that in your specific scenarios that you're putting in here, it's a great fit because you can, with release one, it, it needs to do something, but it could be crashy. You put in very minimal chaos testing in there, right, that just says, hey, what happens if it crashes? No big deal, right? That's okay. If you're then moving the reliability needle forward in release two, then maybe you add an additional test or two to make sure that it really is reliable in the way that you expect it to be. And then release three, if it's an urgent feature, it sounds like that's probably a different feature than what you had before. So again, you could add in some basic chaos testing that just looks at that, or maybe don't even do chaos testing on that feature at that point. And then re release four, when you're trying to stabilize it, now maybe that's when you introduce some good test, some chaos testing there. You know, chaos testing is iterative. There's no reason that you have to test the whole ship. You can test just the rudder on the initial testing, and then you can expand and test the ship, you know, test the portholes and test the sails or test this, the smokestacks or whatever. You know, you can expand it as it goes and as you are prioritizing your requirements. I think it's actually a pretty good fit for that type of thing. Um, you know, and then if requirements for functionality are dropped, you could drop the chaos testing that you're doing, but if it's automated, why not keep it? You know, does it hurt the system? If it's not counter to a, re to a requirement to keep that chaos testing in place, keep it in place. Then you're overachieving on what your customer is asking for, and that's rarely a bad thing. Okay, so how to make sure the right chaos tests run against the right versions of the software. Yeah, that's definitely a management question that you would have to worry about, a configuration management question. Um, typically, if you're updating your chaos testing, it's all, you know, the idea behind automating the chaos testing is that it's going to be treated as code as well, right? So when you merge your, your chaos testing in, you're merging it in probably with version control, and then you can run the version, the updated version of the chaos testing with the updated version of the software. I don't know if that makes sense, but, you know, there's always a configuration management question anytime you're running multiple versions of a system. And I don't think managing the chaos tests is any different from managing any automated unit tests that you're running uh, or automated integration tests that you're running or anything like that. It's the same type of problem. All right, so where are we doing chaos engineering within Parsons? 
right? This is all great. It's all fun to talk about. It's cool technology and it's an interesting strategy, but are we actually using it anywhere? Have we done anything with it? And the answer is yes, we have done some stuff with it. Our cloud services team here in Denver DTC has injected chaos engineering into several of the systems that we support. Um, you know, we have a variety of different projects. We've done more or less chaos engineering on them. Most of the ones that are listed specifically on here, we really haven't injected much chaos into, but we have injected it into the CNSP um, system. And, you know, we've done a variety of different things. We have a DevSecOps pipeline in place in one of our programs that specifically brings up a stack and then starts knocking out a few of the, the components of the stack and makes sure that data continues to flow. And if we lose our data flow, which is what we really care about in that system, then we fail the test. So chaos engineering has been implemented to a degree within our systems already. Um, within some of them, it hasn't been implemented as fully as I would like to see us do. But again, it's an iterative process. This is something that we can grow at and become better at over time. But the cloud services team understands chaos engineering and we are always available. So if you have questions or concerns or things that you're interested in, you can reach out to us via Slack and we'll, we'll provide you with resources and, you know, answer your questions and help you work through things so that you can start pulling this in. And that was my last slide. So let's come back to questions. Uh, so Timothy asked if there were guidelines or best practices like CMing your chaos test together with the code or using tools X and Y that support keeping chaos repo X, chaos runner Y in sync with software under test Z. Um, and, you know, there, any, it, I would say the best practices would be very similar to your automated unit test and your automated functional tests, you know, and your automated integration test best practices. So ideally, yes, you keep your chaos tests in line, either using manifests that tell you what version of the test to use and what version of the system to test on, or, you know, using a tool. You could do, you could bring in Gremlin and they do have tracking like that within their service that they offer. If you don't want to pay licensing fees, then there are in some of those common Git repos that I shared on one of the earlier slides, there are some management tools that have been open sourced and shared that you could try using. The other thing that you could do is automate the execution of the tests, but force it to be triggered by a human interaction so that you can then go in and say, hey, I really do want to run this chaos test on this system right now. And you could allow that to be a human triggered thing. Um, you know, there's there are a variety of different ways that I've seen organizations and companies implement chaos testing. Um, you're going to end up using the tool and the way of doing it that works best for your system. My standpoint and my starting point would always be treat it like you do your unit tests and your, you know, integration tests. See them at the same way. And anytime you push updates to your software, run those chaos engineering tests. And if you need to update the chaos engineering tests to meet the capabilities of the new software, do that. There are a lot of resources out there for chaos engineering. The chaos engineering community is very, very active. They have their own Slack community that is constantly blowing up with people sharing how to help and how to implement things. You know, so I can provide a set of uh, resources that are out there for people if you're interested in learning more about chaos and trying to kind of dip your toes in that water and see what ripples you can create. All right, anybody have any other questions? I think that's it. So, Jennifer, thank you so much for your time today. These sorts of discussions are worth having for all of us. Uh, some of our projects may be moving to a maturity level where this is extremely effective. And some of us who are just getting started uh, can, can plan to have these types of testing patterns. Either way, it's good to have background knowledge and know who the people who talk to are within the company. So thank you very much. I really appreciate it. And thanks to everyone else who came out today. We'll see you uh, next week at the same time.